Welcome. Thank you for joining us for another online program from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I'm delighted to be your host. I think you're in for a real treat tonight, even if you've been a long-term history buff, because our speaker, Tom McMillan, is going to introduce some new material to all of us. Tom McMillan was, until recently, the communications director for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He has a background in journalism. He's been a writer. He's been a talk show host. Uh, and he's been a sports writer in particular. But his newfound passion is history. And Tom has decided to dig into new information, which he is enthusiastically sharing with the story tonight of Generals Hancock and Armistead, whom we all know from the movie Gettysburg. Tom, I'm going to turn the program over to you. I can hardly wait. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, and this book obviously comes out of the movie Gettysburg. Um, and and I, I will challenge uh, some of the myths and legends, hopefully correct some of them. But in saying that, I always like to start by saying I love the movie Gettysburg. I mean, it's what really got me in, back interested in the battle as an adult, like a lot of kids who grew up in Pennsylvania. I'm from Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, go, going to Gettysburg is part of vacation. And I loved history, loved the Civil War, but sometimes life just gets in the way, job, family. And then this movie comes out in 1993, and I go to see it at a theater in Pittsburgh on a Tuesday night. I drove to Gettysburg three days later, and I've had the illness ever since. I did it backwards from a lot of people in that I saw the movie before I read the novel it was based on, which is this group knows is Killer Angels, which had won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for fiction all the way back in 1975. But as I remind my Gettysburg friends, the key phrase there is not Pulitzer Prize. The key phrase is for fiction. Because yes, the novel and the movie are based on a, on a foundation of Gettysburg and Civil War history, but there's a lot of fiction involved, especially with the conversations. And the novelist, Michael Shara, does it so well that often you can't tell the difference between fact and fiction, fiction and, the, and the big screen is very, very powerful. So it's really affected the way we look at a lot of these stories. So many great stories in, the, in that movie, but the one that always stuck out to me. Uh, was the story of Lewis Armistead and Winfield Scott Hancock. And as Shara presented it, what, what a story that was. Two friends, almost brothers, uh, served together in the U.S. Army. They're torn apart by the Civil War. Uh, they have a, a teary-eyed farewell out in California. And then they meet two years later in the most famous attack of the war, Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, where Armistead's men attack Hancock's men and both fall wounded. Great story. I, I wanted to read more about that. I wanted to read a book about Armistead and Hancock. Uh, one didn't exist. Actually, one of the great Civil War scholars, Ethan Refuse, uh, reviewed my book for the Civil War Times. He said, I, I can't believe it took 30 years for someone to look into this. Nor can I. I really wanted to read it by, by somebody else. But back in the 90s, so, okay, there's no book on Armistead and Hancock. Well, I'll read about Lewis Armistead. There has to be a lot written about the Confederate general who achieved the deepest penetration into the angle at Pickett's Charge. There's even a monument there for him. Not much. 158, 159 years now, there's been one biography written on Lewis Armistead. It's a little 60-page pamphlet book. Now, it's done by Wayne Motts, the legendary Gettysburg guide and current president of a Gettysburg Foundation. So you know it's well-researched and well done. But that's it. Now, there's a lot written about Hancock. He's a hero of the battle. He lives for 20 years after the war. He runs for president in 1880. Lots of books from late 19th century until just a few years ago, there was a, there was a book on Hancock. Most of them barely mention Armistead. Some don't mention him at all. So you start to think, you know, what, what gives here with this story? I would ask my friends, learned uh, battlefield trampers, you know, people really into the Gettysburg story. I would say, what do you know about the story of Armistead and Hancock? And almost to a person, what they knew was two scenes from the movie Gettysburg, uh, where Lewis Armistead is talking with his commanding officer, uh, James Longstreet, on the eve of battle. And he's talking about the farewell with Hancock uh, back in California. And he quotes himself. And this is one of the great scenes of the movie. He said, when 
So help me if I ever raise my hand against you. May God strike me dead. May God strike me dead. That's how close Shara said these guys were. Louis Armstrong's a hard-nosed soldier, but the scene, he, he's having trouble bringing himself to the reality he's be, going to be fighting against Hancock, uh, his good buddy, even though uh, they have decided to fight in different sides in the Civil War. But that's the novel version. That's the movie version. There was only one person who was at that get-together out in California who ever wrote about it, and that was Hancock's wife, Almira. She does quote Armistead as saying, may God strike me dead, something to that effect, but it, it's in a slightly different context. What she said, he said, is I hope God will strike me dead if I'm ever induced to leave my native soil, should worse come to worst. And I'd show that to my Gettysburg friends. And they said, that, that can't be it. That's not what I heard. That, that's not very compelling. Well, she was there. So how's this happen? Well, it's, it's a tool that novelists and movie makers do to draw us into the story, to, you know, to, to, to sell the story. It, it's something that happens throughout. They, they take these phrases, and but these are the ones that stick with us. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, those scenes where Armistead was talking to uh, Longstreet, they never happened. Uh, Shara made those, up, made those up as well. So now beyond this, okay, that really didn't happen that way. Uh, well, tell us, people say, tell us about them together at West Point. Certainly they went to West Point together. They did not go to West Point together. Louis Armistead, the older man, by seven years. Armistead born 1817, Hancock born 1824. Louis Armistead was through his escapades at West Point, serving in the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant in a war down in Florida, the Second Seminole War, before Winnie Hancock even enrolled at West Point. Uh, they would meet later on the frontier. So what about letters, personal letters between these two almost brothers? None exist. There are no letters from Armistead that even mention Hancock. There are two letters from Hancock that mention Armistead, but they're written years after the battle and the war, and he's merely inquiring about the circumstances of Armistead's wounding. So it really leads you to believe, you know, what's going on here? I think that this lack of evidence, or, or at least lack of easily obtainable evidence, has led a lot of people to question this story, to question the depth of the friendship. Were they friends at all? Did Elmira Hancock make this all up? Well, I've written the book that uses the word friends in the in the subhead. I'm here talking before you today about it. So you could, you could probably conclude that I concluded that they were friends. I'm confident in saying they were pretty good friends. They were not almost brothers. They weren't even best friends in the modern sense. And then they spent so much time away from each other. Uh, but they they served together in the U.S. Army. They served in the Mexican War in combat. They built that bond as soldiers, and that bond lasted 19 years until they met on the fields of Pickett's Charge. So to me, the real story is still a unique and compelling story, and one really reflective of what the Civil War did to our country. It's just not the same story that we heard in a novel and movie, and that was why I was really interested in writing a book and, and getting to the bottom of this. So who were these guys? Lewis Addison Armistead came from a very distinguished military family from Virginia. Uh, Armistead men had been serving in some sort of the U.S. military since the year 1680, when his third great-grandfather was colonel of the horse militia in Gloucester County, Virginia. Armistead men fought in all the early American wars, and Lewis's father and three of his uncles were U.S. Army officers in the War of 1812, four brothers from the same family in the generation just ahead of his. So let's look at that roster. Captain Lewis G.A. Armistead, the original Lewis Armistead. Uh, G.A. stands for Gustavus Adolphus. He was named for the famed uh, 16th century Swedish warrior. Uh, he commanded a rifle unit, was killed in action against the British at Fort Erie in 1814. Captain Addison Armistead commanded coastal fortifications in South Carolina, died of disease while on duty in 1813. Let's look at those names. Lewis and Addison. What's our Civil War guy's name? Lewis Addison Armistead. He's named for two uncles who gave their lives in the War of 1812. But the most famous of the uncles is the third one, Lieutenant Colonel George Armistead, who defended Fort McHenry in the Battle of Baltimore when Francis Scott Key wrote the National Anthem. 
Not only that, but George took the flag, the original Star Spangled Banner. He took it off the flagpole after the battle and took it home as a souvenir in complete violation of, of Army regulations. It remained in the private possession of the Armistead family for more than 90 years until George's grandson donated it to the Smithsonian in the early 20th century. So if you go tomorrow morning to the National Museum of American History down in D.C. and you go to that second floor Star Spangled Banner display, go into that, into that darkened chamber and see that thin wisp of a 200-year-old flag that came directly out of the Armistead family, one of the most iconic pieces of early American history. But George doesn't live very long. He, he dies in 1818, probably of a heart attack just a few years after the war. So the longest living and therefore highest ranking of the brothers is Lewis's father, Brigadier General Walker Keith Armistead. Not very famous today, very well known back then. Third man ever to graduate from West Point. In 1818, when Lewis is one year old, Walker becomes chief engineer of the U.S. Army. In 1828, when Lewis is 11, he's promoted the Brigadier General, one of the highest ranking officers in the Army. So, folks, it's no coincidence that Lewis Armistead was a soldier. It's a, no coincidence that his three younger brothers all became Confederate soldiers and fought in the Civil War, something I did not know until I was doing this research. It's no coincidence that his son, also named Walker Keith, was a Confederate soldier and on his staff at the Battle of Gettysburg, an eyewitness to pick his charge. Military service was part of the Armistead DNA. Now, Lewis wants to follow in his father's footsteps. 1833, he gets an appointment to West Point. It is probably the most storied career of anyone who never graduated. Three years on campus, never got out of the freshman class. That's hard to do. Now, he... He was sick a little bit, obviously wasn't a very good student, and he got in a fair amount of trouble. He, he would pile up the merits, but in his third year on campus, 35-36, remember he's taking the same classes now for the third time. He's moved all the way up to the middle of the academic rankings, which should tell you something. But there's a, this entry in his academic records, or his military records, uh, in January of 1836. Uh, Cadet Armistead is hereby placed in arrest, charged with disorderly conduct in the mess hall on the 16th. Limits his room. Hmm. Now, exactly what happens, no one knows, because there was a fire at West Point that destroyed lots of records before the Civil War. But the story that made its way through the Confederate Army is that Lewis got into a mess hall brawl with another future rebel general, Jubal Early, and hit Early over the head with a plate which is certainly believable to many of us who know Early's reputation. There were probably a lot of people who wanted to hit him over the head with a plate. But as much as we laugh about that today, it's considered a very serious event at the time. Lewis talks with his father, the Brigadier General, and they determine the only thing for him to do is to write a letter of resignation. So he does that. He writes that letter. There's no guarantee it's going to be accepted, but the superintendent of West Point writes a letter to the Secretary of War and says, we hope it will be accepted as a courtesy to Brigadier General Walker Keith Armistead. It is, in fact, accepted. Uh, Lewis does resign. So you may have read he, he's thrown out of West Point. He, that's, that's not the case. He, he does resign. Now, there was about a three-year gap in the story of his life, not much until the summer of 1839, when in July of 1839, he gets, as a civilian, a commission in the U.S. Army as a second lieutenant. Uh, there's a war going on down in Florida. The Army needs officers. The Armistead name still means something, so he, he becomes an officer. Now, interesting to note that Lewis's last class at West Point graduated July 1st, 1839. Their commission's date to that day. Lewis Commission dates July 10th. All those shenanigans, not even on campus the last three years, he only loses nine days in rank. It's a good thing to know people in high places. Your dad's a brigadier general. Your, father, your uncle's a U.S. congressman. You're in the Army. Off he goes to the Second Seminole War. A rude introduction to Army life. About the second or third day there, he's in a hot combat with the Seminoles. But not long into his tenure in Florida, the U.S. Army makes a change to its command structure. And who do you think is the new commander of all U.S. troops in the Florida theater? You guessed it, Brigadier General Walker Keith Armistead. So uh, Lewis is soon added to his staff as an aide. His experience there changes dramatically, but he does get to see how a general runs an army up close, which is, which is very valuable. Serves out his term, early 1840s. He's sent to the frontier 
to a place called Fort Towson in what is now Oklahoma in the Indian Territory. And that is where, in 1844, he will meet a young man named Winfield Scott Hancock. So what's Hancock's story? He does not have the military pedigree of the Armisteads. No one would at the time. But his father has a thing for historic names. That would be his father, Benjamin Franklin Hancock. Uh, Benjamin Franklin Hancock and his wife have twin boys in 1824. They named one Winfield Scott after the famed soldier of the era. They named the other Hillary Baker. I wasn't familiar with that name at all, but learned out Hillary Baker was mayor of Philadelphia. These guys are from southeastern PA. He was mayor of Philadelphia, fought in the Revolutionary War, relatively famous local name at the, at the time. And uh, six years later, they have another son. They name him simply John, John Hancock. And John Hancock is with his brother Winfield at the Battle of Gettysburg. So both Armistead and Hancock have immediate family members with them at the battle. Now, Hancock's an impressive young man growing up in, uh, in Norristown, Pennsylvania. At the age of 16, he gets an appointment to West Point. His father, Benjamin, doesn't think it's such a good idea. Not only is he young, 16 is the youngest age you could get in at that point, but he's small. We think of big strapping Winfield Scott Hancock, right, big guy? How tall he was when he entered West Point? Five feet, five inches tall. One of his fellow classmates years later writes in those early years, they considered Hancock their pet. The great Winfield Scott Hancock was their pet. Now, he does have a growth spurt. He's about six feet tall by the time he leaves, but he's small for a fair amount of time. And boys being boys, he gets picked on. He gets bullied a little bit. At one point, it got so bad that one of the, his larger classmates had to step in on Hancock's behalf to fight one of the bullies. And that classmate is none other than Alexander Hayes, who ends up commanding a division under Hancock defending Pickett's charge. Now, it sounds like it's an apocryphal story. It might have been made up. But, but Han we get a lot of those stories in this era. But Hancock writes about this later in life. He writes, when I was a boy, I once had a difficulty, and Alexander Hayes was the first to volunteer to assist me. And then extracting me from my trouble, became involved in aforesaid difficulty himself. I never forgot his generous action. Amazing relationship that these guys have long before the Civil War. Now, Hancock's not a very good student, but unlike Armistead, he does graduate. He's uh, 18th in the class of 1844, 18 out of 25. Uh, late in his tenure, the great Winfield Scott does come to campus. As he often did, he seeks out his young namesake. There's a story in an early Hancock <clears throat> biography. The Hancock has to be uh, sent to the regiment farthest on the frontier. That's probably apocryphal, but what happened was he got sent to the regiment farthest on their frontier to Fort Towson in the in Indian Territory of Oklahoma. And that is where in October of 1844, we have the first record of Armistead and Hancock being together. They are part of a 15-man officer corps on this very remote post uh, at the far reaches of the country. It's on the edge of Texas, which at the time is a republic. It's as far as ways you can get and still be in the United States. Uh, but they live together and work together. Uh, they served together for 16 months on the frontier. In 1845, they are transferred together to another remote Oklahoma post called Fort Washita. And that is where there are only six officers. So this is a return, army return from Fort Washita in late 1845. Six officers and a chaplain. You see, Armistead is listed third. Hancock is listed six. Six officers. Do you think they knew each other? Of course they did. They probably lived in the same officer's hut. This is where the relationship really bonded. It's also the only time period where we have a piece of evidence uh, of Armistead and Hancock being together that is not a U.S. Army record. This is a letter that Armistead wrote to a fellow soldier. Now, it's a mundane letter. I put it up here largely because he has beautiful handwriting. You see his signature, lower right corner, L.A. Armistead, Lewis Armistead, or Lewis Addison Armistead. Next page, who signs the P.S.? <laughs> w. Hancock. L.A. Armistead, W. Hancock. So they're, they're signing the same letter. You know, of, of, of course they were friends. Now, 1846 happens. War with Mexico breaks out. These guys want to be there. Uh, they arrive at different times in different places, but they serve in the same infantry regiment, the 6th uh, U.S. Infantry. Uh, they fight in some of the same battles. They're both breveted for gallantry. We know a little bit more about Armistead because he's older and slightly higher ranking. This is the time when you see other soldiers, when they write about Armistead, they all talk about his bravery. This is something that continued throughout his military career. May not have been a great strategist or officer. He was a very brave officer. and He was said to be the first U.S. officer into the ditch in the final attack on uh, Chapultepec Castle. 
Now, these guys also served together for a number of months in the post-war occupation. From the time that the shooting ended to the time the peace treaty was signed, the U.S. Army occupied Mexico. Uh, Armistead commanded a, a small company. His lieutenants were Hancock and another young man just arrived from West Point, Henry Heath. And Heath, writing memoirs decades later, gives us third-person confirmation of the friendship. He writes, Armistead Hancock and I were messmates and never was a mess happier than ours. So these guys, again, friends hanging out long before the Civil War. Now, Heath and Hancock are about the same age. Armistead's older. Heath and Hancock are single. Armistead's married. So during this post-war period, Heath and Hancock are going out in the town almost every night looking for nightlife, trying to meet young ladies. Heath writes about this a lot in his memoirs. He writes, he writes that Hancock's so good-looking, he was like a magnet for all the young ladies. And even poor Heath got to meet a couple. He says one night, he writes about it, he says, one night I see Hancock telling a young lady, I love you. Next night, a second one, I love you. Next night, a third one, I love you. He says, Hancock, uh, how can you tell these different women you love them? And Hancock told him, Heath, we are still at war, and all is fair in love and war. So uh, a lot of these passages in, in Heath's book, it's, it's, it's fairly entertaining. Now, they are, they are transferred together uh, after the war to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. Same thing happens. Heath and Hancock are going out of the town looking for nightlife, and Heath is with them when Hancock meets his future wife, Amira Russell. You can make a case that Hancock is closer to Heath than he is to Armistead, at least socially. But the book isn't Heath and Hancock, it's Armistead and Hancock. That's what Michael Shaw wrote about. So we'll, we'll get back to our, uh, to our main story. Now, what kind of family life did these guys have? Winfield Scott Hancock had about as stable a family life as you can have uh, while still being an Army officer in the 19th century. He and Elmira have two children, boy and a girl. Family's almost always together. When Hancock's on post, it's in the Third Seminole War out in California. They're there with him. Uh, and they remain married until Hancock's death in 1886. Armistead, by contrast, has a very, very tragic personal life. Between 1850 and 1855, he loses two wives and two of his three children uh, to disease on the frontier. What would that have done to you? Tough enough losing one person from your immediate family to lose four in five years. Well, he became sullen. He became bitter. Others, understandably, other soldiers write about this. It's, it's very understandable. One of the reasons I bring it up is also so the figure, the, the Lewis Armistead figure you see in the movie Gettysburg, that's not the way he would have been at this time. Life had dealt him a different, different deck of cards. Now, in the 13-year period between the end of the Mexican War and the beginning of the Civil War, 1848 to 1861, Armistead and Hancock are almost never together. There is one time, late 1850s, where the entire 6th Infantry gets together and makes a legendary 1,000-mile march to the West Coast. They're together for a number of months. They catch up. They tell stories. But as soon as they get out West, they're split up again. Uh, Armistead is sent to what is now Arizona to deal with some Mojave Indians who were harassing settlers. And Hancock is sent to the quaint uh, West Coast town of Los Angeles, California, population 4,000 at the time, where he will be a quartermaster. And one of his duties is to supply Armistead's troops. Now, those of you who have done, have done research know that you can actually find a lot about these guys during this period from reading the newspapers. Reporters love to write about the Army and the soldiers. And the problem is it's painstaking research. It takes a lot of patience. I have no patience. My wife, Colleen, has lots of patience and is a great researcher, so she loves these assignments. And I'll say, okay, summer of 1859, uh, California, L.A., Armistead Hancock, can you find anything? And 20 minutes later, she yells down, how about this? How about this? Extra, outbreak of the Mojave Indians. Look at that first paragraph. An express arrived last night from Major Armistead at Beals Crossing of the Colorado to Captain Hancock. Quartermaster at present residing here, conveying intelligence, on and on and on. So really, really cool piece of evidence, I thought, that I'd never heard referenced before. Armistead and Hancock are working together. The bond continues, even though they're hundreds of miles apart. Now, Armistead does his job well. He wins his battle with the Mojaves. Uh, he earns a very well-deserved leave of absence. He turns that into almost a full year leave of absence. He spends almost the entire year of 1860 back home in Virginia. He's even listed in the county census that summer as though he lives there. Well, he gets to catch up with his elderly mother, with his young son, Walker, young son, Walker Keith. 
and also uh, with some friends in the area, one of whom, a nearby neighbor, is the future Confederate general, Cavalier, Turner Ashby. Now, Ashby is running a local militia unit at the time. Uh, they were called in the year, year before to the John Brown raid in nearby Harper's Ferry. Uh, they were there to put down the raid. He and, uh, and his men were there when Brown was hanged. So Ashby really has a sense of, of what's going on in the country. He, he thinks there might be a civil war. He's telling Armistead this. Armistead's been away for so long, he, he just can't get his arms around it. He thinks Ashby's being really negative, and he says, Turner, do not talk so. Let me sing you a song and wipe away your gloom. With that, Louis Armistead started to sing the Star Spangled Banner. And Ashby, it was said by his bi biographer, joined in. So there you have, nine months before the Civil War, these two future Confederate generals singing the Star Spangled Banner. Just amazing what the Civil War did to this country. Armistead can't stay back east forever. He has to get back to his post. His new post, San Diego, California. He arrives there in late December of 1860. He's 120 miles south of where Hancock is. time he gets there, South Carolina has seceded. Other states are lining up. The guys in the Army, the Southern guys, are talking, U.S. Army, what should we do? Mrs. Hancock writes that a lot of them went to Hancock to ask him for advice. He was a well-respected officer. He didn't have much advice. You know, Garnett, Richard Garnett went to him. Armistead went to him. Maybe Pickett. Um, he didn't have much advice. This is what uh, Hancock said. I can give you no advice as I shall not fight upon the principle of state rights, but for the union, whole and undivided. I cannot sympathize with you. You must be guided by your own convictions, and I hope you will make no mistakes. This was an easy decision for Hancock. I mean, yes, he's a northerner, but he's 100% a union man. He's not an abolitionist. William, Winfield Scott Hancock was, was a solid Democrat. He was not an abolitionist, but he was fighting to keep the Union together. It is a very difficult uh, decision for Armistead. I mean, yes, he's a native Southerner. Yes, he grew up, you know, he comes from a long line of slaveholders. He grew up on a farm with 19 slaves. He owned at least one, maybe two slaves himself for a time during his life. He believes in the Southern way of life. But his whole history, and the history of his family is tied up in the U.S. Army and the Star Spangled Banner. It's a tough decision for him to make. He wrestles with it. As we know, he uh, he does choose the Confederacy. He fights for the Confederacy. We do have his ex an explanation. It's an obscure letter that I found in his son's military records at the National Archives. In December of 1861, Armistead wrote a letter on behalf of his son, trying to get his son into some officer training program in the Confederate Army. And he writes this letter, again, very beautiful handwriting, December of 1861. This is the crux of what he says for our story. I've been a soldier all my life. I was an officer in the Army of the U.S., which service I left to fight for my own country and for and with my own people, and because they were right and oppressed. For my own country and for and with my own people. That's why Lewis Armistead fought for the Confederacy. Which leads us to the famous farewell gathering. A lot of questions about this. Did Elmira Hancock get the date right? Did she get the guest list right? Did she make it all up? Did it happen at all? A lot, a lot, some people think it didn't happen at all. Go online. You can, you can find the skeptics. I think something did happen. Might not have been exactly the way she described it, but I think it did. First thing when you're researching it, you have to decide, okay, who did she say was, was there? And was it possible they were all there in L.A. at the same time in this time period, spring, late spring, early summer of 1861? She only mentions three people by name. She says more people were there, but only three by name. Armistead and Hancock, obviously, and Albert Sidney Johnston. So could they all have been together in this time frame in L.A.? Yes. Oh, Hancock and Albert Sidney Johnston lived in L.A. at the time, and they were friends. They got together. We know from various records that Armistead was through uh, L.A. at least twice in, in May for three-day periods. Those are in the newspaper, so he's prominent enough that newspaper reporters saw him. We know from a letter that he's there in later June. So that's three documented times he's in L.A. Could have been others. So I believe the circumstances existed uh, for this to take place. Now, what did Elmira Hancock really say? Most people know the version that's in the movie Gettysburg. What did she really say in her book? This is how she described it. 
The most crushed of the party was Major Armistead, who, with tears which were contagious, streaming down his face, and hands upon Mr. Hancock's shoulders, while looking him steadily in the eye, said, Hancock, goodbye. You can never know what this has cost me, and I hope God will strike me dead if I'm ever induced to leave my native soil, should worse come to worst. Now, she also said a number of other, of other things that are rarely uh, referenced. She said that Armistead brought along his U.S. Army Major's uniform to give to Hancock in case he, quote, might sometime need it. Armistead, uh, Hancock's only a captain at the time. Armistead's leaving the Army. Here, buddy, do you want my, do you want my uniform? She also writes, she says that, that uh, Armistead gave her a small satchel requesting that it should not be opened except in the event of his death, in which case the souvenirs it contained, with the exception of the little prayer book intended for me, and which I still possess, should be sent to his family. On the flyleaf of his book is the following, Louis A. Armistead, trust in God and fear nothing. So this was not given to Longstreet in a tent on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg. It was given to Elmira Hancock before they left California. Now, if this had been, if hers had been the only account of this party, some people think it is, it would lead to questions because we only have one source, one account. Uh, she could have made it up. I found another account that, that mentioned it. Um, it's an obscure account and an obscure biography of Hancock that was written in 1880 when he was running for president. It's written by the Reverend D.X. Junkin, who thinks credible. He's a reverend. He's a former chaplain of the U.S. Navy. He was a friend of the Hancock family and did some of his work for the book in the Hancock home. This next pa passage I'm going to show you, he attributes it to Hancock himself. He doesn't quote him. I wish he'd quoted him directly, but he attributes to him. This is what Junkin writes. In 1880, seven years before Mrs. Hancock's book, an interesting incident in connection with General Armistead's defection is related by General Hancock in L.A. in early 1861. On leaving Los Angeles, he presented Hancock with his major's uniform, saying that latter, quote, might sometime need it. Goes on to say, he also placed in his hands for safekeeping and to be given to his family if he should fall in battle, certain valuable papers. And this includes, as you can see on the flyleaf of a book, Louis saying Armistead, trust in God and fear nothing. So Winfield and Elmira seven years apart, are telling the same story. The only discrepancy is who got the prayer book. He says he got it. She says she got it. Somebody got it. I believe this shows that something happened. Uh, they got together. So they come east. Uh, first two years of the war, they do not meet in battle. They're in a couple of the same battles. They're both at the seven days. They're both in Antietam. They're pretty close physically at Antietam. They don't meet until the third day at Gettysburg. A question we often get is, did they know they were fighting against each other that day? The answer is probably, uh, you know, Army intelligence would have been pretty good on the third day of a battle in the same place. And you would have battle flags, you have prisoners, intelligence operations. But the real point here, the cogent point is they weren't talking about it. There's no evidence they were talking about it or longing for one another. Oh, Winnie boy. Oh, Low. And folks, I'm not even sure Low was Armistead's nickname. <laughs> There is very scant evidence to that. It's not central to this story, so I put it in an appendix. Uh, I put all, everything I could find about it. You can read it there and make your own conclusion. I titled it, Lo and Behold. So uh, to, back to the charge. Lo and behold, uh, Armistead does lead 100 men over the wall. Uh, you, of course, are familiar. We're all familiar with uh, the Armistead fell here marker. Uh, you know what that looked like about 100 years ago? But that, well, there's a, you can obviously, those of you from Gettysburg know, you can make out the trace of that road when things are dry there. But look at the growth around the angle. It certainly didn't move them on, but here it is, uh, as we know today. It's put up in the late 1800s. Question we get, is it accurately placed? When I'm giving an in-person talk, I often see a lot of people shaking their heads no. The answer is, who knows? Whatever uh, theory you have, you can find an eyewitness account to support it. There are accounts that say Armistead was hit as soon as he crossed the wall. It fell right there. There's one detailed account from a man in his brigade who said he was hit as soon as he crossed the wall and then staggered forward to the second line of guns where he was hit again and fell. There are multiple accounts, Union and Confederate, that he charged past the wall up to the second line of guns where he was hit twice and fell. 
The most credible of these, I think, comes from the Union commander at the wall, Alexander Webb of the Philadelphia Brigade, um, who I think wouldn't have been given the one of the credit Armistead with anything he didn't achieve. But the key thing here is he writes a letter to his wife three days after the battle, just on July 6th, before anyone is spinning the story of what really happened. And he says simply, General Armistead, an old army officer, came over my fence and passed me with four of his men. So I think he got up into there to the second line of guns. We don't know exactly where that was, but somewhere in the area uh, where we see the monument. Now, we all know stories of uh, uh, Armistead being assisted by Union soldiers. They all have Masonic implications. Louis A. Armistead, a proud member of the Masons. The first one is that he used a coded Masonic phrase for distress, something about I'm the son of a widow, and that Union soldiers who were Masons rushed forward to help their fellow Mason. There are enough accounts that it's, it's probably true, but folks, there is no way the Union Army would have let a wounded Confederate general just lay there. Even if not out of respect, for intelligence purposes, they would have picked him up. So Armistead was going to be carried off the battlefield, whether he was uh, a, a Mason or not. The other account is his encounter with Union Captain Henry Bingham, who happens to be an officer by quirk of fate on Hancock's staff. Uh, now, Armistead's a Mason. Bingham's a Mason. Hancock's a Mason. As a result, we have the very beautiful Friend to Friend Masonic Memorial at the entrance to the cemetery annex. In doing research, however, I was stunned that I could find no primary or even strong secondary evidence that Bingham acted, did this because they were Masons. That, that it, he, the only people who know are Bingham and Armistead. Armistead died two days after the battle. Bingham only wrote about this twice, both in private, well after the war, both in private letters to his fellow Mason Hancock, never mentioned it. So there's no evidence all of Bingham said or Bingham told me. This has all been kind of inferred. In fact, if you read Bingham's full account, he is told there's a wounded Confederate general. He's told it's General Longstreet. He thinks he's coming to assist James Longstreet, who is not a Mason. He was going to help him anyway. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very legitimate monument because they were all Masons. I could just not find no uh, evidence that there was a Masonic implication as to why he did it. Now, Bingham comes up. They identify themselves. Uh, Armistead here is on Hancock's staff. He identifies Hancock as an old and valued friend, an old and valued friend. And then, according to Bingham, he gives him a quote, which is still controversial to this day. This is six years after the battle. Uh, quote, Bingham quoting him, I have done him and done you all an injury, which I shall regret or repent. I forget the exact word, the longest day I live. This has led to a lot of speculation that Armistead was recanting. Folks, I don't know what he said or if Bingham quoted him correctly, but everything I know about Lewis Armistead and all the things he said before this, even a few things he said after it before he died, there is no way he was recanting. Whatever you think of him, he was a proud Confederate soldier. Uh, he is carried, as we know, to the George Spangler Farm Foundation. Gettysburg Foundation has done such a great job of restoring that into what a field hospital would have looked uh, like in that era. Doctors, union doctors, do not think he'll die. They don't think his wounds are fatal. They are astonished when he dies two days later. July 5th, he dies. He passes away. Now, you know, they don't know much about germs back then, obviously. there could have, Some people speculate there was a wound they didn't discover. I, I doubt that. Uh, the medical people that Wayne Motts talked to and, and, and that I've talked to uh, think it was something called a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot that would have formed in his leg and, and gone to his lung and would have caused a quick death. Whatever the reason, uh, he dies. He's buried there on a, in a shallow grave on the Spangler farm. His story might have ended there except for a cold-hearted uh, Gettysburg doctor who digs up Armistead and bombs him thinking the family will pay for the body. And he was right. I run uh, correspondence between a doctor's friend and Lewis's first cousin down in Baltimore, Christopher Hughes Armistead, the son of the hero of Fort McHenry. Christopher wants the body. They work at a deal. In October, he pays $100. It is sent to Baltimore. Christopher picks it up, takes it to Old St. Paul Cemetery, buries it in the same family vault as his famous uncle, uh, the hero of Fort McHenry, George Armistead. A lot of mystery about this. It was on a talk a few years ago where a ranger said, we know Armistead's in Saint, Old St. Paul's. We don't know exactly where. 
This is where. How about that? Nameplate, side by side. George Armistead, Louis Armistead. Old St. Paul's is essentially a private cemetery. It's gated and locked. They do tours on occasion. I was able to finagle my way in and take a photo, and sometimes they open it. But this is this shows they are buried together in the same vault. Okay, so that's Armistead's story. Hancock. Now, it's really eerie, folks, that Hancock's wounded at about the same time, almost on a straight line, just a couple hundred uh, just a couple hundred yards away. A lot written about this. Uh, we know he's carried off the field. He recovers from his wound, but he never fully recovers. He's back in action about six months later. as a pretty good day at Spotsylvania, but he's never really the same man physically. And I think that's why he never advances to command of his own army. I think he was on that track, uh, but he serves out, throws through the remainder of the war. Uh, uh, in 1865. Uh, the book details won't go into a lot of details here. He's a very interesting post-war life. Uh, he oversees the execution of the Lincoln conspirators. He fights Indians in Kansas. He is briefly the military governor, controversial military governor of Louisiana, where he gets into a big feud with Ulysses S. Grant. And he actually runs for president three times. He's the nominee once, but he runs for three times. He was almost a presidential uh, or vice presidential nominee earlier. But he runs in 1880s, a Democratic nominee. He loses to James Garfield. Very close election, 9 million votes. He loses by 9,000. Retires from public life at that time, stays in the Army. Returns to Gettysburg for the final time in 1855 where he argues famously with the great historian John Batchelder over the proposed location of the Hancock Wounding Monument. There it is today. It was put up after Hancock's death. Hancock argued it should be closer to the angle. I was closer to the angle. Batchelder is just as, as stubborn. He does not move it, so that's where it is today. Certainly nobody questions Hancock's valor. But the one thing about this trip really good is afterwards, uh, Hancock take ba takes Batchelder and a few dignitaries on a tour of the battlefield. How cool would have been would it have been to walk and ride the battlefield 22 years later with Winfield Scott Hancock? What a gift uh, to history that was. Good thing he did that. A few months later, February of 1886, he contracts an illness and he dies. Uh, he is buried in a uh, family vault in Norristown, Pennsylvania, that he built when his daughter died as a teenager. This is it. Uh, I can visit it today if you're ever out there. Uh, Hancock and his daughter are buried here. His wife and son are buried elsewhere. So now the story of Armistead and Hancock was not well known or talked about in the 19th century. It was not talked about at all in the early 20th century. It had faded into oblivion. It was not until the 1950s when the great historian Bruce Catton, in his book Glory Road, writes about the friendship using Elmira Hancock's book for the first time as a source, and it takes off. The public loves it. Shelby Foote picks it up for his trilogy. Michael Shara picks it up for Killer Angels. The movie Gettysburg picks it up. And now, all of a sudden, it's one of the most famous stories of the battle, uh, one of those overnight sensations that took 100 years. The one person who would not have been surprised is their old friend, Henry Heath. Again, he wrote his memoirs decades after the battle. They were published, I think, in the 1890s. So I end my talk with this quote, something I'd never seen used before. This is what Heath said. Those two regimental associates, messmates, and devoted friends never met again on earth, but I'm sure have met again in heaven. I think Armistead was killed by Hancock's troops, and Hancock was wounded by one of Armistead's command. What a commentary on civil war. Thank you so much. I enjoyed uh, sharing the story with you. So, Tom, my question to you is, how much of this argument at school was Armistead, and how much was Jubal Early? I mean, we all know Jubal Early's temper. I would think that he would have been the one who instigated it. What facts are there on that incident? We, we really don't have many facts. It's a, it's a legend that comes out of one account, and everybody believes it. Clearly something happened. We know some of the West Point records were... Uh, destroyed in a fire. And there's no record that exists of what happened in this particular incident. We do know that Armistead was disciplined. Uh, we do know that it was serious enough that even his father, a brigadier general, couldn't get him out of it and said the best thing to do to avoid a court martial was, was to resign. Uh, the account comes from Walter Harrison, who was on Pickett's staff. And he just writes in his memoir of the, of the Civil War uh, that Armistead had hit early over the head with a plate. 
And it's it's you know some, it's clearly something happened. It's believable because early was cantankerous, but there's there's not a lot of supporting evidence uh, of it. And uh, interestingly, there's no evidence that they. You would think if it happened, they're serving in the same armor during the war. They would have talked about it. That would have been written somewhere else. It just wasn't. Either people weren't fascinated about it. They didn't know it at the time. Uh, it's these are one of the things that frustrate you as students of history and historians. You, you can't find all the facts. It's a tantalizing story, but clearly, uh, it's not apocryphal because something happened. Something happened serious enough for Armistead to be disciplined for something in the mess hall, and that he actually resigned from West Point in disgrace. What would have happened if he didn't resign? He would have he would have faced a court martial. And, oh, so he'd have to go to trial. Yes, and and that was their idea was the only way to avoid a court martial was to resign. So they must have thought the odds of winning in court, so to speak, were not very good. And if you were court martialed, there's no way you would be able to serve as an officer in the army again. If you resign, and Dad's a brigadier general, and things happen, you know, three years later, we forget everything, and they needed officers, and he became an officer. So okay, thank you.